Jesus. 
Good evening, good morning everyone and I'd like to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are so grateful to God for another opportunity to rest in his presence, to um, find fulfillment of life in the presence of Jesus our Lord and Savior. And for this morning um, we are going to be reading from the book of Genesis. Uh, but um, today's sermon is going to be um, a bit different because it starts um, a series um, that we are going to be doing. Um, I'm going to be starting as of today a, a series. It will be a build up. We are doing what I would call the Jesus series. And so we are going to track Jesus in the Old Testament moving all the way into the New Testament and then we are going to finish that series there when we finally finish with the Gospels and then from there we are going to enter the second phase and the third phase of the Spirit and um, of the series so whenever we do this uh, new series then I will inform you that we are now beginning a different one and they are all going to be um, quite well connected and that is what we are looking into uh, today. Our scripture reading is going to be from Genesis chapter 4. Okay, Genesis chapter 4, that is where we are reading. And we are going to focus on a few verses um, that are, 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 are dotted. So we are going to start reading from verse 1 of Genesis chapter 4. And we are going to take it all the way to verse 13. 13. So it's Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1 all the way to verse 13. And then we are going to jump and read verse 25 and 26 of the same chapter. So it's Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 to 13 and reading verse 25 and verse 26 all in the same chapter of Genesis chapter 4. And this is what it says. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you must overcome it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from, the, from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God had appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him 
also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for the opportunity to once again not only read your word, but also find its meaning. Father, I pray that we may not only find the meaning of the word to keep it in our minds, but more than that, that we may be given power to actually implement the teachings of your word in our lives. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus. Amen. The story we have read in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to repeat the location of the text um, for the last time for those who may uh, have come on to uh, the service just now we are on Genesis chapter 4 we are reading from verse 1 to 13 and as well as verse 25 and 26 we read there now that Adam and Eve are no longer in the Garden of Eden. As you will recall, we have tracked the fate of humanity. Adam and Eve have fallen into sin, but the desire of the devil is to lead them to eat from the tree of uh, life, so that in eating from the tree of life, they may gain their immortality as sinners. And God then performs this great act of grace through which he evacuates them from the Garden of Eden. Because through this act of evacuation, God would confirm and seal that they could be redeemable in future, seeing as they now had lost their conditional immortality, and they have become truly mortal and are going to die. But in them being able to die was he did the very fact that they could then be saved. And so they are now out of the Garden of Eden. And the Bible tells us that they settled not far from the Garden. And the Bible then tells us that the Adamic family now increases. Their first children uh, are Cain and Abel. Pay attention also to the fact that Adam and Eve had many, many, many other children. However, the Bible specifically will focus only on three of their children and not the rest of the children. The Bible specifically focuses on the firstborn, whose name is Cain, and the secondborn, whose name is Abel. And after this, the Bible also informs us of a thirdborn son whose name is Seth. And when you read the genealogy in Genesis 5, we come to realize that many other sons and daughters were born to Adam and Eve, but they were not the focus of the story. The story merely focuses on the three boys who have a story that we are relating to this morning. Now in the story, the Bible simply tells us that these two young men were different in terms of trade. There was Cain, who was a tiller of the ground, and also there was Abel, who was the one who kept the livestock. Now the Bible tells us, when you read in verse 3, and in the process of time, and that is where we will begin. The Bible does not clearly tell us whether God had instructed whether there would be particular offerings that needed to be made. Also, the Bible does not explicitly tell us 
what kind of offerings were to be made. We only make some connections between the fact that when Adam and Eve had sinned and were naked and afraid and ashamed, we are told that the Lord then covered them with tunics made of skin. Even there, the Bible does not explicitly say that the skin was from an animal that had been killed. We simply make that connection because we know that the Bible does not suggest that he took their own skin and he used it to cover them. But this is a text that we will revisit in detail during this Jesus series as we track Jesus in the Old Testament. What we may be able to say is that it does appear that God then killed an animal and from this killed animal we now come to know that the nakedness or their nudity would then be covered. Then we go further. We come to then discover that Adam and Eve now have children and we now come to know that in some process of time that's the second part in some process of time Adam and Eve have children and these children are then required to come and bring an offering again the text does not tell whether this was an instruction from the Lord or whether this was a movement from their own hearts. We are also not so clear whether this offering they were going to make was going to be related perhaps to the sin offering that God would have made as we have come from the previous text in uh, killing that animal and then using its skin to cover them. The phrase in the process of time is different to the phrase in the fulfillment of time because the phrase in the fulfillment of time would have implied that there definitely was an instruction that at a particular time Cain and Abel must present themselves before God to make their offerings. The phrase in the process of time seems to suggest that as they were living their lives they were then motivated to bring an offering to God. And again, as I say, guided by the translation, there would be a different implication if you say, in the fullness of time, and when you say, in the process of time. In the process of time also implies that there is no particular monument or instruction that they are trying to pursue to fulfill. They are merely coming before God to offer gifts of worship. Now when they came, they came based on who they were and what they had. Cain was a tiller of the ground. He brought to God fruits vegetables, seeds, nuts, you name it. This, when we read the story, the story does not suggest 
that Cain gave God the second best or the third best. It appears that Cain gave God the first grade of what he had. In fact, God himself supports this idea when he now punishes Cain, he says to him, the ground is cursed because of you, and when you till the ground, it will no longer give you the best of what you expect. Meaning, prior to this, it used to give him the best, which gives us the understanding, therefore, that what Cain offered to God at that time was indeed the best of what he had. Equally, Abel would do the same. He brought the first links of his livestock to give as an offering to the Lord. Here, we have just come from Genesis chapter 1 where we know that humanity is not created as meat eaters, but we are created as plant eaters. Up to now, we have no verse that suggests that human beings now consume meat. While it is true that Abel offered living creatures, we don't have a text that suggests that after the burnt offering, he ate the meat. It simply paints a picture that everything that was offered was burnt. Now comes the first of the questions we must answer. Why did God reject the offering of Cain. If Cain's offering was a first grade offering, and more than that, it was in line with God's instruction of what humanity must eat, surely then the offering of Cain was acceptable. And the offering of Cain was in line with what humanity consumes. The offering of Abel was accepted. But this offering required death. It brought death. And we know that death was not to be in the initial plan of God for humanity and for life itself. And yet, God accepted the offering of Abel. What was going on? Consider this verse also very much in the context of the health message, where we strongly encourage for health reasons that we should not eat meat but instead we should try by all means to eat plants as they offer the healthiest approach to living. If at all we were to go by this, it would not make sense for God to reject a plant-based gift, but to accept a death-based gift. What was the issue that led God to make this decision? Now the Bible says, because God did not accept Cain's offering, Cain was very angry. And the Bible tells us he had a conversation with his brother. And after that conversation, they went to the wild where the conversation continued in the field. And the conversation ended with Cain killing Abel. Perhaps here, 
For practical reasons, we ought to pause and learn the difficulty of what the story is teaching, that not all conversations end in life. Some conversations end in death. And perhaps let me be much more clear in saying this is true of all forms of death. I think here the story is giving us a very important warning that the conversations that take place in your mouth and my mouth as we speak, do our conversations end up with the death of Abel or the life in Abel? Perhaps let me put it in an even more practical sense. When you speak of Abel in your mouth, do your words kill Abel? Or do your words bless Abel? What is the consequence of the conversations in our mouth? At times we fail to understand, and Jesus would later say this, that you don't kill a person by murdering their body but the words we speak about people are murder or they are life so when you talk about anybody the question that we should ask ourselves when I open my mouth to talk about a friend a relative a colleague a church member, a pastor, when I open my mouth to talk, if my mouth was to be, con my words were to be converted, would they become weapons of blessings? And when they reach that person, would the person live or die? after my words dangerous conversations result in death but good conversations result in life and i pray and hope that all of us may make this a choice that whenever we speak let our words judge themselves that if they were to be converted into life or death, we would know what would happen or to those we were talking about. All conversations either end in life or in death. All words that come out of our mouths either bless life or they curse somebody not to succeed. And so one ought to be very careful. Words produce actions. And those actions may lead to either life or to death. As we see in the story, Cain spoke with Abel. And the end of the conversation was death. He was angry. He was angry because God did not accept his offering. And so God comes to him. God says to him, tell me, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? And God says to him, my rejection of your offering is very straightforward. If you do what is right, you will be accepted. If you don't do what is right, you will not be accepted. Perhaps here we are beginning to learn part of the many painful consequences of sin. That sin will give birth to rejection. Cain is angry because he feels rejected. And God says to him, I did not reject you. I rejected your actions, which are not coming from the right place. Rejection. 
Rejection is one of the most painful things that human beings go through today. We are rejected in many different ways. We are sometimes born and are rejected. Sometimes people love others and they are not loved back and they are rejected. Some are rejected because of how they look. Some are rejected because of where they come from, their background, what they have or they don't have. Cain had experienced one of the pains of sin, a rejection of his gift. And unfortunately for Cain, he assumed that this was a rejection of himself. And when God comes to speak to him, God tells him that there are issues behind the rejection of your gift. What are the issues? God tells him the issues. God says to him, beware. Sin is standing at the door of your heart. Its desire is to overcome you. But you must rule over it. Here now God gives us the challenge that is at the heart of the rejection of the gift. God is saying to him, when you and your brother came before me to offer your gifts, I saw at the door of your heart, sin was lingering there. It desired to overcome you. Now we may reverse the text such that even if God had told them what to bring, Cain would not have brought it because he already in his heart has a serious issues with God. Sin already settles there. And God says to him, it is because of the sin resting in your heart that I am unable to accept your offering. This is not about what you brought, but this is about the attitude of the giver. What is your attitude when giving? You know, a person may give you a gift in a manner that insults you rather than showing that they appreciate you. A gift can be used to insult. A gift can be given in such a way that it tells you how much you are unloved rather than how loved you are. And this is the problem God is addressing. That the attitude of the giver matters as much as the gift being given. There are people who will give you a gift and they will wonder why you are not so appreciative. And at the heart of it is the attitude with which they gave you. An attitude that communicated more evil than good. Yes, dear friends, let us not simply pat ourselves at the back when we give gifts and think we have done a good job. The attitude of your giving will always matter more than what you gave. That is why there is a saying that says, it's the thought that counts. Because people investigate the source and motive 
of the gift more than they uh, investigate the gift itself. God, by the way, throughout scripture is very constant in saying, I want to see the attitude of the giver more than the gift. It doesn't matter to God what you bring, how much it is, how expensive it costs, how clean it is. If the attitude of the giver is not right, then God is not pleased. And this is true of life itself. You know, one of the things I remember as an illustration to this, growing up in uh, rural areas, you know, or semi-rural areas, there would be those families that would have cars. And I always was fascinated when the rain starts pouring very badly um, in church. And uh, those who live far away are going to need lifts. There were always people who would make very difficult statements. Statements that would make you prefer to walk rather than um, to get into their cars. You know when someone will say, before they give you a lift, they'll say to you, I can give you a lift, but um, please mind how you are sitting. I don't want you to get in my car uh, with, with your, wet, uh, your wetness or your wet shoes. You know, I work very hard to clean this car. Somewhere in there, in the favor of being given the lift, is also an insult about how you cannot afford to have a car. And so, we knew that there are people who would offer us a lift but we would gladly decline and say, no, it's fine. There is somewhere where we are going to pass. And you would find a big group of people choosing to walk in the rain and the mud simply because the attitude of the giver insulted you more than the rain and the mud was going to harm you. It would be better to be muddy and wet than to be dry but amounting to nothing. God here teaches us when we give, we must think about our attitude as givers. Whatever you do for people, don't make people feel like they owe you and they must serve you. Whatever you do for people, don't create an atmosphere where now people must worship the fact that they were assisted by you or by me. But more than that, we must not help if we are going to create the idea that people are a nuisance and they bother us. If you feel that someone is a nuisance and they bother you, don't help. This way, they don't have to experience the attitude of a giver which is more damaging than the gift that is being given. God was clear to Cain. You gave me your best, but you gave me in a way that you did not actually want to give me. There is a sin in your heart. You are harboring it against me. 
Though you have given me your best, it does not come from a heart that wanted to give. Then God gave him a warning of grace. God says to him, now listen, young man, the sin that I see in your heart, its desire is to overcome you, but you must master it. Two words, very important. Desire, must. What God is saying to Cain, desire does not have to come true. Desire is not guaranteed. He says sin desires you. That's all it has. It just desires you. A desire may or may not come true. You may desire money. It doesn't mean you will have money. It will just be a desire. Desires are exactly that. Wishes. Longings. God says to him, sin is thirsty for you. Sin is longing for you. However, sin is not guaranteed. It will get you. Only you can allow sin to take over you, Cain. And then God says, but you must master it. The word must and the word master are very different. They are instructive. They are affirming. They are words that issue a guarantee that even though sin may desire you, you on the other hand have more authority to overcome it than it has the authority to overcome you. Cain left and after he killed his brother, Cain had not listened to God's words. Then God came later and God says to him, where is your brother? Cain replies, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? In this answer, Cain reveals the true essence of what is going on. He uses the word the Redeemer, which as we read it in its translation, also means a custodian of something, a keeper of something. So when we read it, it will say, am I my brother's keeper? And in its translation, it means a redeemer or a custodian or a keeper. So he is asking, let me ask you, God, who is God between us? Who is God between you and me? Why are you asking me where my brother is? If you are God, should you not know where my brother is? What is Cain talking about? Cain is saying, from the moment I was born, from the moment I was told the story of how my parents fell into sin, I have had a problem with you, God. Because I believe you are the one who is irresponsible. Where were you when my mother was in the garden alone? When the snake tempted her, where were you? Where were you when my father found my mother already naked because she had eaten? Where were you? When I was killing my brother, where were you? When I killed my brother, I proved my theory. Killing him was my experiment. I wanted to prove that you are an absent, irresponsible God. We are in this mess because of you. Are you not the one who is supposed to be our keeper? Are you not the God who is supposed to be our custodian? 
the heart of Cain was a conviction. Sin is God's fault. He should have been the custodian and the keeper. And God failed his duties as a God. He could not keep his parents safe, Adam and Eve. Neither could he keep his brother, Abel, safe. Then God, God answers him in a manner that will now make Cain realize he is far from wisdom of what he thinks he understands. Then God says, I will tell you where your brother is. I will tell you because the Lord does not ask in order to know. The Lord does not ask in order to be given information. Like your parents, when they had sinned, I came to the garden and I asked them, Adam, Adam, where are you? I did not ask them because I did not know where they are. I asked them so that they may reflect on the fact that they have chosen sin over me. That the power of choice I had given them, they have exercised it against me rather than for me. And God is saying, when I asked you, where is your brother? I want them to remind you that like your parents, I warned you before you killed your brother, I gave you an advantage over sin. I told you, sin is at the door of your heart. You did not listen. When I told you, you have power to overcome. You did not listen. I am not asking you because I don't know where your brother is. I am asking you so that you may see you have fallen far from me and that only by humility can I show you mercy and grace as I did to your parents. Then God says, I know where your brother is. His blood cries out to me from the ground. I know where your brother is. His blood cries out to me from the ground. The first murder had been committed on planet Earth. But the interesting way is how God phrases it. He doesn't say, your brother cries out to me from the ground. He doesn't say, I know where your brother is. He is dead. You buried him. He says, I know where your brother is. His blood cries out to me from the ground. The blood is crying out from the ground. God says it is your brother's blood that is making us have this conversation. I am here talking to you because your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What on earth is God talking about? And right there is the significance of it. God is saying to Cain, there is blood, blood that is able to speak. There is blood, blood that is able to speak to God. And this blood, it speaks from a dead person 
but it speaks on behalf of the living. Your brother Cain is dead, but his blood, it speaks to me about what you did. His blood calls for justice about what was done. This blood speaks from the dead, but it speaks concerning the matters of the living. And God says, because of what you've done, I now put a curse on you as you go out to roam the earth. But immediately, Cain realized that he had been foolish. He realized that his ideas about God had been a mistake. The God he thought was a failure was now the God he was crying to. The punishment is too heavy. I cannot bear it. Show me mercy. Where was mercy going to come from? Mercy was going to come from the blood that speaks. Because only the blood can atone for the sin that he had done. The very blood that he had spilled was now the blood that points to the true blood of Calvary. Where at the cross, the blood of the dead man, Jesus, would speak for the living. The living that crucified him were the same who were going to be atoned for through the blood that he was going to spill for them. And the story ends with a very powerful text. In verse 25 and 26, grace, grace that was shown to Cain through the symbolic blood of Abel is now revealed in verse 25 and 26. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, Then Adam knew Eve and conceived a son. And she called him Seth because he was a replacement for the son that had been killed. Seth is the new son. Seth is the substitute. Seth is the means through which Abel resurrects again. Seth, the new son, becomes the son who will heal the wound for the death of Abel. In Seth, we are already pointed to Jesus, who will be the second Adam, the rebirth of creation, the resurrection of what sin had killed. In Jesus, what sin had killed rises again. A new creation is born. That is why Paul says, Whosoever is in Christ Jesus, that one is a new creature. Because of the rebirth found in Jesus. In Jesus, Seth is re rather in Seth, Jesus is represented as the new Adam, the firstborn of all that sin had destroyed. In Seth, Abel is born again. Abel, the victim of sin, is resurrected in Seth, just like we in Christ Jesus are born again. Today's message is about laying the foundation for tracing Jesus through the Old Testament. Because one question must be answered. We see Jesus in the New Testament saving us. The question may be, to particularly for those who don't believe, why do I need Jesus? 
Why do I need my sins atoned for? And it is in tracking Jesus in the Old Testament that we are going to see how Christ is at the center of our very existence even as at the beginning of all things. Cain, his story ended with grace because Cain the murderer received grace through the blood of his brother which symbolizes the blood of Jesus at Calvary. However, more than that, Abel, the one killed because of sin, in Seth rises again, where Seth represents Christ, through whom all who have died because of sin may now resurrect in Christ Jesus. But does the story end there? Absolutely not. Verse 26 says, And then Seth gave birth to his own son, named Enosh. And the Bible says the name Enosh means something important. It means, now men shall call upon the name of the Lord again. Now notice the beauty of what is happening here. The name Seth means God has replaced what has been lost. The name Seth carries in it redemption through restoration. And Enosh, meaning that the humanity or man will call upon the name of the Lord again. The name Enosh should remind us at the crucifixion when Jesus had cried Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani then the Bible says in the temple the curtain was torn and a lamb that was about to be slaughtered by the priest escaped and the true meaning that from now onwards, it shall no longer be animals that represent us before God. Because the true lamb has been sacrificed. But also, in the torn temple, it was a clear message. Now there is nothing that stands between God and his holiness. Through Jesus, mankind can now call upon the name of the Lord for themselves. And so in Jesus, we received our set Enosh, our restoration and resurrection, as well as a direct right to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so, in Genesis chapter 4, is born the story of Jesus that we will track through the Old Testament as we see salvation revealed. May God bless you and may God keep you. And as we listen to these words, let it now be a, a confirmation in our minds. Just as Cain received the grace from God, let me be very clear to you right now. No one, absolutely no one, is beyond the redemption. For all of us, whether you are feeling as though you are dead because of sin, or whether you are feeling as though sin has created a barrier between you and God, remember this story. In Jesus you have said Enosh, there is no sin that will kill us beyond what Jesus can resurrect. There is no sin that can create a barrier between God and us. In Jesus, we have our set Enosh. In Jesus, we have our resurrection 
and our restoration. In Jesus, we have our rebirth and our reconnection. Christ is our set in Osh. He is our resurrection and our reconnection. In Christ, we have come back to life. In Christ, we can call upon the name of the Lord. Whatever used to stand between us and God, whether it be death or it be sin, it no longer stands between us and God because of Christ Jesus. I want to say this to you. When I grew up, I remember very well in church, preachers saying to us, you will go to a nightclub on Sabbath, meaning Friday evening. And while you are entering the nightclub, the angels will stand back and they will not enter. And you will go inside alone. And things may happen there. And you may die in sin. And as young people, we would get scared and imagine while we are somewhere in the nightclub, maybe an earthquake happens and we die in the nightclub alone because God's angels did not enter with us. Oh, but dear friends, it took to grow in Christ to know there is no such a thing. Nothing will ever stand between God and his children. Let me be very clear. Whether you are entering a nightclub, God will be there. Whether you are going to fornicate, God will be there. Whether you are going to, to perform a cash heist, God will be there. God may not like what we do, but he will not leave us alone. In Christ Jesus, God is our set in us. He is our resurrection and reconnection. There is no time when we will venture alone and God will let sin to do as it please in our lives. God does not approve of everything we do. But in Christ, he stays. He stays so that when we have done messing up, he will be there to save, to resurrect, to reconnect. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that for the many canes that are in this world, there is a God who will not forsake us. You are our God and the scripture is clear. You will not allow us to be left to the mercy of sin. Scripture confirms that sin may desire us, but that through Christ Jesus, you, dear God, have mastered sin for us. And this morning I want to pray for those who are feeling as though they are too far away from you. Those who are feeling as though they are not worthy to go to a church or to be among believers. Let it be known this morning that Christ is our set in us. In you we have our resurrection and our reconnection. I pray, Heavenly Father, that may we never preach messages that close the door of grace. May we never preach messages that make people feel as though they are too far for, from you and that we may never be saved. Thank you, dear Jesus, for this message. And thank you for Christ, who is our rebirth and our reconnection. Through him and him alone we pray. Amen.